Okay, so we'll uh, resume and um, uh, move a little more gradually, systematically uh, to some of the representational choices which, uh, uh, which we've made over the, over the past 10 years. So I'm going to be talking about our spatial as a community and then about representing spatial data. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do first is to indicate that uh, when we were talking about how to represent spatial data, then we had um, a range of ideas uh, about how this might be done. But once you publish software, then it starts living its own life and there are autonomous uses so that other people start using things that we've done as they download things, they install them, they use them in their own production and we have they don't ask us, they may contact us uh, to ask for uh, facilities added to, to, to software. But by and large, there's, there's, there's only contact uh, when, when, when some problem arises or when something needs, needs fi fixing. So first I'm going to give you some examples of autonomous use, that's people from the outside who've, who've, who've uh, uh, used uh, things. And... Okay, just, it may ring, but if it rings, it means lunch has arrived. Um, then I'll, so I'll give you these, these, these examples, and then I'll move on systematically to, to show how the R spatial community has developed, and, and then, then how the, and we move on after that to look at the, the actual principles. So the, the, the examples that I'll be taking up are, uh, are from a number of sources, so I'll run through them uh, briefly. Uh, in 2011, uh, the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United, United Nations uh, converted its statistical yearbook to automatic production using R and LaTeX, and then R Spatial was involved in the creation of the maps. If you look at the, uh, at the yearbook, you'll see that there are uh, quite a lot of tables, so that they're, they're made in R and, and formatted in LaTeX, um, and there are many graphics, among them maps, and the maps are made with the tools that we'll be using uh, here, so that they're the standard R, R spatial tools. And they, they did uh, intervene and ask us uh, specifically to, <coughs> to modify the ways in which legends could be, uh, could be constructed, because they had relatively many cases where there was no data. So they wanted a way to separate out the no data. Um, but apart from that, the, the, what they're doing in a large production setting is more or less the same kinds of things that, 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 that we'll be doing. I, I was very pleased to see that they were making use of it and that they made use of it in a very, uh, very sensitive and, and, and um, uh, supportive way, so that they contributed code back to help us uh, with the legends, uh, legend construction in the class int package. Class int is a small package for finding class intervals for, for, for thematic mapping. Uh, another example is the use of uh, Google Earth. This is, this is Tom's work with many other contributors uh, for uh, using some of the facilities and the API on, on Google Earth uh, to allow you to display data uh, which has previously been, uh, been um, handled in R. So this is, this is then uh, taken from one of, one of uh, Tom's uh, web pages and will be what he's talking about, or one of the things that he's talking about on, on Thursday. But you'll see it in lots of other situations that other, other people use this as well. So you're also possibly uh, aware, as you've seen from Tom's introduction, that you can use uh, contextual backgrounds from Google Earth, uh, Google Maps, OpenStreetMaps, and so on. So there are lots of ways of putting a contextual contextual background behind your spatial objects or spatiotemporal objects. Uh, another uh, example which, which hit me, uh, surprised me somewhat, was a talk given by uh, a, a disaster epidemiologist uh, in disaster medicine. Uh, Charlie uh, DiMaggio gave a talk at, at USAR last year, uh, and he was describing how uh, he'd been using the tools for representing and mapping data in dispatching his um, graduate students to help people. So what they were trying to do was find out from, uh, from the sources they, they could get of where there were damaged houses, where the damage had been uh, caused by Hurricane Sandy, 
and he was able then to tell his graduate students, well, you, you want to go there, not there. Uh, and he has a web, web page which describes how, how the process that they went through to do that. He has lots of other graphics on, on the web page and, and elsewhere on his website he has lots of things. But uh, the thought that struck me and certainly when, when he talked to me, he said, well, it simply made everything much simpler for us that we didn't have to look around and find out ways to do the mapping and do the, uh, do the um, uh, sort of subsetting of, of areas um, in alternative software, so that we could do it all within, a, within an environment that we were familiar with. Uh, there's another, um, the, this, is, this isn't a blog, it's a web page, but the, here's a blog, one of the popular, uh, popular spatial uh, blogs is, is uh, James Cheshire's spatial.ly, spatially. Um, it's at uh, University College in London. And he's, he's m possibly more um, enthusiastic about things. As you've seen from my introduction an, uh, an hour ago, that I try not to be in enthusiastic. I try to be serious and say, think about scientific me methodology. And he would say, hey, but there's much more fun there. And so, so, so I'm less fun than... He is, but so he, he wants to have fun. Uh, I, I, yeah, fun's great if if it turns up, but it's it's not an absolute condition. Uh, getting getting stuff done is perhaps is uh, the someone someone once said that I probably should come from Missouri. I don't come from Missouri, but they have a the state motto, unless I'm wrong, and an American could correct me, is show me. Is that the state motto of Missouri? It's show me. So, okay, so I'm a show me guy, and James Cheshire is a fun guy. So that's why I like seeing the code. Show me. <laughs> so that he, 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 he writes things like this. this. This is talking about our software established, one of the best around for statistics, include, increasingly recognized as a tool for data visualization and spatial analysis. So that, that, that was a, a blog uh, uh, last year. And then he had another blog in June last year so that, uh, that log files from uh, the R Studio uh, uh, mirror of uh, R software have been made available. And so you can show where in the world people using R, the most active R users, uh, are present. There are, there are a real lot in Alaska. <laughs> So, but I'm not sure whether this isn't uh, bulked up from the whole of the U.S. So that they, that what he's doing is taking the the IP number of the of the people who've downloaded stuff and is trying to associate the IP number with a location and then bulking up the location and then drawing a, um, a, a, a rubber map of of of, of the locations. So I, I'm, not, I'm not going to ask the question, so I'm going to jump straight into the answer, which was given on a different blog by Oscar Pepignon, whom I hope we'll be talking to on, on th Thursday uh, in, in the, the round table. What he says is, more or less explicitly, uh, that's uh, James, James Cheshire, used the R Studio, R Studio logs to give an answer to the question, how many people use this R package? In my opinion, such a question cannot be answered safely with the R Studio download, download logs. The R Studio mirror is a sample that cannot be reg safely regarded as representative of the mirrors network. The mirrors of the comprehensive R archive network, mostly operated by public and non-profit organizations, uh, R Studio is a company, provide f faster package download for users at their geographical locations. And instead of going to uh, download from the cloud, uh, you can download in, in Bergen. The server is at the University of Bergen. So in Norway, it's at the University of Bergen, but it's on a fast academic network. So everybody in Norway downloads from the University of Bergen. And that's quicker than going to our studio's cloud. So that's the point uh, Oscar Papignon is making in this case. So what he's saying essentially is that this is, this is a biased sample of our users and that, for instance, uh, we're not seeing China as well represented as it certainly should be. There are very many users in China about whom we know relatively little. But uh, Edsra and I got, and Vigilio, we got surprised by being approached, is, is it okay to publish our book in Chinese? So we said, we're very flattered, it's very nice. And it's out, and it, it, probably there are more sales of that book in, and than the one in English. We don't know, we haven't seen the figures, but my, my guess is that, that it, it, that's the way things are. Uh, so the, 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 this isn't, isn't necessarily a great sample. 
and Oscar is sort of participating in, in the discussion. But Oscar has also now got a book out, uh, which, which uh, I'll wave around on, on Thursday. Uh, and he does some really nice uh, thematic cartography. So this is, this is a multivariate choropleth map where uh, the different parties in the, uh, uh, the, the previous, so that's the, the last Spanish general election before, uh, before 2012, uh, are, these are the, the, the parties with their relative densities and then all of these are over, overlaid with, with a, um, a varying amount of transparency so that, that you see mixtures of colours. It's perhaps not the easiest map to read but that was the map you wanted to make, so, so that, 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 that you could make it. As perhaps now I should, uh, I should uh, be uh, um, um, rather expressive. As, uh, there was a comment previously that you can do all kinds of things in R. For people who've been using R for a little longer, there's a two-line script uh, for this, which you use as well. You use this one. The, the uh, Fortune Yoda. No, but, but, but so, that, that, this, this one. So the, okay, so the, this, you, you contribute uh, fortunes to R as well. Because so when there's something amusing, then, then it's contributed to the fortune, fortunes package that uh, uh, nerds in general and R nerds, older R nerds, have fortunes because fortunes used to exist in the Unix world. Do they exist in, in Windows? Does Windows have fortunes? Windows doesn't have fo win has fortunes? Uh, so, uh, apart from R, I mean, yeah. But in in the Unix world, then the nerds had fortunes because it was when nothing was working and y you wanted something to, to to kill the time of day, then you you p picked a fortune. Uh, so that here here we have it: library fortunes, which contains the database of all of the fortunes so statements, and the one uh, the w the way to find this one is fortune Yoda. So you search for the string Yoda, which is Simon Blomberg. And the question on the uh, uh, R help mailing list uh, nine years ago from Evelyn Hall was, I would like to know how, if I can extract some of the information from the summary of my NLME. And Simon Bl Blomberg re replies with, in about 30 seconds later, this is R. There is no if, only how. <laughs> Which is, is perhaps a little over the top, but... Uh, but that, that was, that was uh, Oscar's point here. As he said, this, this must be a terribly difficult map to make, so I'll make it. And so he made it. Uh, and, and both in his book and, and the, the, the blog entries that he has about choropleth mapping, very interesting from that point of view. So that you see people uh, taking what we started with uh, 10 years ago and, and going very, very much further than we... I mean, much of this is, is going way beyond what we imagine. Um, R is also used to. Pre this is from the local newspaper in Bergen. They they've been running a series of a series of, uh, of articles about immigrants in Bergen, like me, um, and so that they 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 managed to get the uh, the boundaries of the municipalities with without difficulty, and they could get them in. Uh, but um, and then they have the, you. This is dynamics. You click on on Bergen. This is Bergen here, and you can find that of the 271, uh, or almost 272,000 people in in uh, this is 2014, it's the first of January 2014. Then 36,258 were not uh, Norwegian citizens, and there were 180 different nationalities. Uh, 3,200, 3,300 from Poland, Lithuania, Iraq. Uh, Germany, uh, Sweden, and so on. This is the population curve, and this is the the uh, um, uh, immigrants. So they did that, but then they they went to the uh, the smallest uh, statistical reporting area, uh, and this is this is my street. Um, this is my street where it says that there are seventy two foreigners, and that's one of them, me, and then my family. So four four of those live in my house. Um, so it, at that point, I became a little concerned that the unreflective or untrained observer may jump to conclusions that you could say, well, well this is now, well, this is 17%, so it's doing worse than the city as a whole. So perhaps there are too many of these foreigners, we could, should move these guys out. And, uh, also, the definition of a foreigner is interesting because in Bergen, uh, although you may think 
Um, is there anybody here who was born in Bergen? There is nobody here who was born in Bergen. So even if we've lived here all of our working lives, we will not be accepted as being from Bergen. You have to be born not in your generation, not in your parents' generation, maybe in your grandparents' generation, best in your great-grandparents' generation. If, if you're pure Bergen for four generations and none of your uh, mother, father, grandmothers, grandfathers are from anywhere else, you may be accepted as being a, a, a Bergen person. So that they really should define probably, of, of the 427 inhabitants, they probably got three who are native and everybody else is an, is, is, is an immigrant. Uh, really, I mean that, that's the the, the 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 way the way the city works. It's 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 very proud of its identity. So, but the data can be once you start sort of saying, okay, we have open data, we can go down to this low level. It's very easy to misrepresent, and especially if you're using it on a news site, then you can see you can immediately see the commentary column under the news articles about this. Oh, there are so many foreigners living in my district, and. Uh, it's, it's not so easy to represent uh, how, how to do things. So what about our spatial? We've seen how people have taken what we did and moved forward, so I'll now try and give you a view of where we started from. Uh, some uh, some uh, 16, 17 years ago, uh, I was, uh, I was um, uh, asked to teach a course on spatial analysis for master's students at the university. And so I started looking for, uh, for software. And you could do some things with GIS, and you could do some things, but not spatial things, with the statistical software they had. But otherwise, it was difficult to put together a package which was, was going to work on the, the computers they had. So I started looking to see what was available in open source. And R had just emerged and had, was starting to be used at the university already then. And certainly by, uh, by, by 10 years ago, it was used quite widely. So the, the University of Bergen uh, student labs all had R installed with about 100 packages, so that uh, both in, 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 uh, in the science faculties, medical faculties, and elsewhere, then, then R was one of the things which was, which was being used. So it made sense to, to try to find software within R for doing, uh, teaching a course in spatial analysis, in particular statistical analysis. So I was interested in having uh, code for point patterns, which came from Lancaster, the Splanks. I uh, was interested in having uh, some, something geostatistical, uh, which um, uh, Albrecht Gephardt had worked on, and then also people at UCAR. And then 2003, GSTAT came in. Uh, so that's point pattern and, 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 and geostatistical um, uh, in, in interpolation. And then other uh, methods of analysis, uh, uh, disease mapping and so on, have accumulated as, as time has gone on, with contributions coming from, lots of, again, lots of people but including uh, Vitilio uh, Gomez Rubio's uh, uh, D-cluster package. I, I've written uh, SPDEP, which is for more so social science and social econometric, uh, spatial econometrics applications. So who gave the very critical uh, comments here at Santa Barbara? What were you about? Uh, at Santa Barbara in 2002. Okay, so uh, the, 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 the next step after working with Albrecht Gepard was uh, was when Kurt Hornig, who runs the uh, uh, Comprehensive R Archive Network, he said, well, what you've done with interfacing grass is interesting. Can you come and talk about it? So I went, came and talked about it at the meeting for all of the R people, so all of the R people in the world assembled in, in Vienna, uh, and the room was uh, less full than we are now. This was in, in March 2001. So then I, I explained why I thought interfacing grass and R was a good idea, because you could do some of the statistic, statistical things in R, and then you, if you needed to do GIS things, you could move the R data out there, do them there, and then bring it back again. And, and they, they thought that was fun. Uh, and so I was encouraged to, to take things a little further and was, was asked uh, to go to a meeting about the use of spatial statistics in the social sciences in Santa Barbara in 2002, where... Uh, nobody else who's here now was there, right? 
but people like uh, uh, Gilberto Camara and uh, Konstantin Krivorochko and so people from different communities were there, and um, some of them were 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 very critical. They said that uh, if if you're using open source software, all you know is that the people who are writing it are totally irresponsibly because if they were responsible, they'd take money for it. Um, <laughs> That, well, well, it wasn't actually. That that was it was somebody else, and I'll be silent about who they were. Uh, some of these people have changed their their views as time uh, has gone on, uh, but the, there was at that stage there was very considerable resistance to the idea that a, a responsible organisation can use open source software because there's nobody there's nobody to sue. As if, as, although if you read the EULA in, in proprietary software, you usually find that they say that any, any errors occurring because of the misuse of our software, uh, the user's problem, not our problem, uh, then, then the, the, the mentality was that, that open source is, is dangerous. And also that, well, who is reviewing your code? If you're not running in an organization where code review is, is within, a, uh, within a very controlled environment, uh, before it's published, uh, then that must be dangerous. Whereas open source works on the um, uh, um, release early, release often um, um, mechanism, which is that when when something is not even re not even ready for use by people in general, you release it, and then you allow interaction with the users to refine the product. So it's a different approach to doing things, but it was one with which some people were very, very, very uncomfortable. I think now they would be perhaps a little more comfortable. Maybe not, it's difficult to tell. Um, but by March 2003, there was a thematic session on spatial statistics, which I think was fun. And there was a developers meeting on the fringe, which was great. And that was what, where, where things, where things uh, went forward from. So that uh, in 2003, we, we, we talked about setting up um, and doing a number of things to, to establish a community which would allow us to build on uh, information flowing back from, 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 from other people. So one of the things that we did fairly early on was, was to start a task view, as that the, the, C, uh, the, 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 the comprehensive archive network uh, has... This is the... It's one of the, 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 the ways into the comprehensive R archive network. And up here are the task views. And the task views then, when they began, there were only four or five of them. Now there are quite a lot of them. And um, there's a spatial and a spatiotemporal uh, task view. They're not comprehensive. And some of the things I put in there are put in at an airport and committed without thinking about them. But, but at least there's a list of... Of, of, of some things there. And then Edsa is, is the moderator for the special temporal. Right. Yep. So that if you see things that you need more information about spatial temporal, it's Edsa. If it's the spatial one, it's me. But it's, that's the sort of a, a hub for information. It's very, very uh, uh, dense. So that we're not trying to teach anybody anything, but from here you can link to the, the packages which might be useful or other information which might be useful. Then we have the mailing list. Uh, membership uh, last month of over uh, 3,100. Uh, the postings have increased, and m most of the time we've used this diagram, the postings just sort of go up and up exponentially. In fact, they topped in 2012, 2013, and the tendency is now downwards. There are two reasons for this. One, one which is possible is that, is that uh, uh, people are posting on uh, Stack Overflow, but we haven't been able to separate out, uh, or I haven't separated out the, the spatial bit. There's a paper published um, last, at the beginning of the year on our lists and uh, in general and Stack Overflow. And there was a suggestion that, that people are discussing things somewhere else rather than on, 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 on the R lists. And the R help list, uh, by, by uh, comparison, the R help list has seen a much stronger fall. So that compared with the baseline for, for our communities, we're still doing, we're still doing okay. Uh, partly because I don't know of any of the package developers I'm sort of looking around, do, do you read Stack Overflow? but not regularly, whereas our SIGGEO is regular. And it's the same for you, Edsa? Yeah. 
and I, I, I just don't have time to read Stack Overflow. I'm sorry, it would be nice, but Barry would like us to do Stack Overflow. I don't have time to read RCQ. <laughs> but, but, but you do anyway. Yeah, yeah but it's, 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 if you look at the, 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 the rankings of people who've, who've posted or answer, answered questions, then, then I mean, you, with, with, particularly with Robert here, at the time, I was getting really worried for my star position as number one. <laughs> because because you, 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 I, I sometimes wonder which time zone you're in, because you seem to be replying before people ask the question. You were already reply, <laughs> replying, so... As I'm sure if you have read our SIGGEO, then you'll have noticed that, that particularly Robert, is, if he gets a question, then he gets his teeth into it. And, and this is, this is commu this community. And ten years ago, we thought what we need are people who are engaged and committed. And, and it's happened. It's happened really, really well. So we're very happy about that. And we need, we need to keep in mind the fact that some people are asking questions in different places. However, in the case of our SIGGEO, I would argue that one of the key reasons why the number of questions has been reduced is that a lot of things are much simpler and there's an accretion of knowledge in the archives of the list and elsewhere on the net explaining how to do things and our book has now been out for five years so so that 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 quite often on our help uh, you'll see people as, as i replied to a question about mapping on our help a little while ago, but I just said, well, there, is, there are resources available, look at the task view, and David Vincemius, who's probably the, 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 the lead replier to all questions, said that uh, this guy's reply was very unsatisfactory, he should, that's mine, uh, he's far too modest, he should have said, the only place to go is to buy their book. Um, so that, and, and in much of our, there are now books, so that people are getting information, not by uh, saying, I, I just found your software online. Um, I downloaded it, and I can't run my exam I can't run it with my data. So that ten years ago, everybody would just post to the list, but now they'd, they'd look around, they'd find there's a book, they'd get the book from the university library. Most of these books are, are downloadable from university libraries, and that that answers the question. So that there are fewer questions being asked because more people more know stuff, and know more stuff. There's our forge, which is which is uh, has, has has I think has functioned quite well for us. It has technical issues from time to time, but is is still still there. Uh, and the raster package, that's Robert's package, uh, was on for about 16 months, where where you were advising people to download from our forge uh, and use it from there. And then you went to the comprehensive R archive network, and it's been on there. But as all of us do, Edsa did uh, just a couple of days ago, when somebody asks a question, not necessarily on the list, but also off the list, we'll say, we make a change in the software, we, we commit to our forge, that's the, the, the new version, the development version is on our forge, so that everybody else is seeing the old version until we release it, but the person who asked the question is asked to check whether their problem is resolved from the development version on our forge. If it is, then usually the, the, there'll be a, a release. Uh, sometimes you, you feel a little bit stupid with this with this policy, which I mentioned of uh, release early, release often. Uh, my SPDEP package is now at 0 0.5 hyphen 80. So, so why I haven't moved that to about version 330, I don't know. But but it's it's at 0 0.5 0 0.5 uh, minus 80. That's a hyphen 80. Because some of the changes are really small. So somebody says, well, you could actually, there's a, there's a spelling mistake in the documentation. So, and, and there is, and it, it's confusing. So you change it and you, so that you accumulate uh, releases. The, uh, the uh, SP package, um, we, we took about five years to get from the package to a book. We were talking about the book again from more or less the same time. And when we, when we published the book, uh, the first edition, this, this was what the dependency tree looked like, where most of the package is depending on, on SP, that is using the structures introduced in SP, were packages which we uh, ourselves were responsible for. Those are the ones which are in, in grey rather than being in white. And the white ones were ones where other people had, 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 had done things. But now the release procedure for SP <coughs> involves... Uh, running checks on between 100 and 150 packages. 
because if some, we change something and it breaks something in another package on which many other packages depend, uh, then um, the, the uh, CRAN administrators and comprehensive R archive network administrators um, were making their life difficult. There are very few of them, and they don't have much of a life anyway, so that it's not up to us to make it more difficult, so that we try to run a test on all of the packages which depend on SP backwards. And as you can see, this is, this is getting very uh, complicated, uh, the, 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 the level of, of, of use of the package. So it means we have to, we have to be much more careful than, the, than, than we used to be to... Um, uh, to to uh, to uh, to handle things. So we're now through to r uh, representing spatial data. Uh, I'll now give you my phone. If it rings, it may be lunch. If it doesn't ring, there's no lunch. Well, it it, it may turn up anyway. But the representing spatial data. So what were, what were the kinds of things that, 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 that we were thinking about when we began? Uh, in order to have something to work on, we're going to use an example data set. This is an example data set that uh, originally came from Marilia Sa Carvalho. Uh, it's uh, Brazilian data from, uh, from Olinda uh, and is uh, based on the re re registered or reported incidents of Hansen's disease in census districts in, uh, in the city of Olinda. Hansen's disease is leprosy, if you're unaware of that. Uh, there are a number, of, uh, a number of details of the data set. There are 243 uh, 1990 census, uh, census districts. And then what we have available are the 1991-1996. The that's five years of new cases. That's newly registered cases. Uh, the 1993 year-end population figures and a deprivation index for these, uh, for these census districts. Uh, the data that uh, you have available are now in the form of a shape file, but what was originally available was a map info file. Uh, the map info file contained the census district boundaries, and in addition there was a text file of the, of the uh, values of the variables. So we've now got uh, a shape file. We, uh, we can read it in uh, using a function in the uh, our Google package. Uh, can anyone briefly tell me why you use the library function to load a package? Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 yeah, yes, yes. So, uh, the, 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 the idea that you have in your head is that you have a, a library which keeps many things, many packages, <coughs> and so you go to the library and get a package. So what you're loading is a package, but you get it from the library. But the reason for the name was that S Plus used it. So the, the, that, 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 that's the formal answer. But the, the picture is that you're still in a 20th century library where they don't only have electronic things. They have physical things, the packages. So you're getting a package and you're loading it in, in, <coughs> into a... So that, that purists like us would say, never, never call a package a library. It's a package. Um, the one we've, we've loaded here is, is our Google. You may find my pronunciation of some of these names different from the one which you prefer. That's fine. Choose the one you want. Uh, when I'm calling it CRAN uh, rather than CRAN, it's because it's the comprehensive R archive network to differentiate it from other comprehensive archive networks. There are many or some. Um, when I talk about our Google, it's because Frank Womadam said that he pronounces GDAL Google because he wanted it at one stage to be object-oriented, but it never got there. Um, so the, he calls it Google. So since he's the author, he calls it Google, so I call it Google. So our Google is our Google. But, but you, can, you can choose whatever name you want, uh, but that, that's why I'm using this particular dialect. Uh, the function we're using here to read it in with is, is read OGR. So we're reading it from a data source, and this is the name of the layer in, 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 in the data source. And this is, these are all things that, that, that we come back to. But what, what have we done here in terms of mapping, and what was, the, what was the understanding, and I'll go through this again at least twice, not how to do it, but why, 
what we wanted to do was to make it possible for statisticians to do things which previously had been too complicated or more complicated than necessary, which made it harder for them to work with spatial data. So there were many statisticians who, and there are now, is that you get people like uh, like um, Uwe Ligges or other people who are key in, in the R infrastructure who say, help me make a map. Remind me, what do I need to do to make a map? So there, there are three lines. One, load, load the package. Two, read the data. Three, SP plot of the spatial object and the name of the column. Here we've chosen different colors, but you don't have to do that. So you can, you can get from spatial data, which someone has given you, and you say, well, what on earth is this? Three lines, load the package, read it in, plot it. That's, that's what we were, we, were, we were going for, something which should make it simple for statisticians to do what statisticians like doing, which is not playing with spatial data. That's one of the things we were trying to do, but that was quite important, so that understanding that they needed to be able to handle things which were very similar, in a ways which were very similar to the ones uh, which they're familiar with. So here we have the, have the boundaries of the census districts. This is the Atlantic along here. And the, the way in which the data are stored in R, but not only in R, in many statistical systems is, is as, as rectangular tables, columns are the variables, the rows are the observations, and these data frames uh, are, the, are the ones which we'll also be using. Uh, in R, you access the columns of the data frames with the dollar operator, and that will be something which will be coming up in, 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 in this evening for those of you who are or this afternoon, for those of you who are not familiar, but we can we can look at the date, the, the 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 spatial polygons uh, data frame that we've just read in as though it was a data frame. So we'd then have a data frame with these vari these are the variables, these are the values of the variables. Um, it's behaving in a in a completely standard way. When we began uh, ten years ago, contributed packages dealing with spatial data handled or had different representations for the. For, for, for the data. This made it a little difficult to exchange uh, data. You had to know more in order to move things between, between packages. So we, uh, we considered it necessary or helpful to develop shared classes. It would be possible to develop the shared classes in different ways. These were the ways that, that we, 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 we chose to do it. And there are major spatial statistics packages which do not use these representations, in particular SPATSTAT. But the, the, there are others as well, and that's fine. So we provide bridges to go backwards and forwards from their representations to, 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 to our representations. Uh, the foundation object uh, we decided would be a spatial class, which would be used for, for all, of, all, of the, uh, all of the data, and that would have just two slots. That's, that's two pieces of information which are crucial to, to, to the uh, to the. Uh, instantiation of, of an object of this class. First one's a bounding box that we know which, which part of the world we're talking about. And the second is the coordinate reference system. So we need to define a coordinate reference system uh, because in general we assume that these, uh, these classes are used with spatial data and it's much more difficult, for instance, to use them with medical imaging data. So it's not obvious that you would want to use them for medical imaging or for uh, um, uh, space applications, or so cosmic applications. Uh, this coordinate reference system can be set to, to unknown, but it, it has to be given. The coordinate reference systems are crucial. Uh, this time last one, well, sort of on, on Wednesday, I was talking to a group who were all from geoinformatics, and so I didn't need to talk about coordinate reference systems. Here, probably everybody knows that coordinate reference systems are there in some way or other, but, but what they are and why is, is more of a question that's some, certainly something I'd advise you to, to, to read up on. Uh, not least if you're using data which is coming from different sources, because quite often the data coming from different sources in, is in a different coordinate reference system, and you need to have control of this to, to, get, to get on top of it. Uh, one of the reasons why this has become slightly more organized uh, is because of the European Petroleum Survey Group. They started work when oil was found in the North Sea, sort of... Uh, 
southwest from us, about 200 kilometers. So they found oil, and that's about halfway between Scotland and Norway, and between the Netherlands and England, and between Denmark and England and Scotland. And finding out where the middle of the sea is is quite difficult. If, if, you're, if you have a national boundary on land, you have these, um, you have these, uh, these uh, stakes which are usually painted in lines and with, with, uh, with the, the symbols of the countries on each, each side. But if you try and put something like that in the sea, it doesn't work. So that, that they couldn't decide which parts of which oil fields were whose. So the, they decided that the European Petroleum Survey Group decided to collect each of the country's representations of the coordinate reference systems so that you could see where which one is likely to overlap with which other one. Uh, and we use their list, um, and many other people use their list of coordinate reference systems because it's very conservative. If they don't actually know, then they don't say so that they say the minimum of what there is uh, that's known about this. The, in general, we know much more about coordinate reference systems uh, now than we did uh, 30 years ago. 30 years ago is, is the key date. It's 1984. Um, it's, before 1984, we remembered it because of, of, of the book, 1984, after 1984, we remember it because that was the introduction of the uh, World Geodetic System. With satellite observations, it was possible to measure what, the, what the, the Earth really looks like. So if you have satellites, you can do the trigonometry and find out exactly what it looks like. And you can design an ellipsoid, which is most like the shape of the Earth. And that was uh, agreed as an international standard. It changes every so, is updated every so often, but that's 1984. So the World Geodetic System 1984 provides a global standard for establishing where we, where we are in geographical coordinates, and then projected coordinates come on top of that. But prior to 1984, you'll find that very many places used local, uh, local datums or local sort of anchor points. The anchor point in Bergen, has anybody been to the centre of town yet? Some of, some of you have been through the centre of town. Yeah, not, not many. But when you get there, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a cathedral. And if you go up on any of the sides of the valley, you can always see the spire at the top of the cathedral so that Bergen's local coordinate reference system was based on the cathedral spire because you could see it from everywhere. Okay, so that a lot of older maps are made with coordinate reference systems which are different from the one, ones we use today. So that all of the GPS systems, or all, all kinds, their native way of looking at things is, is WGS 1984. So using the EPGS, uh, the, 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 the EPSG uh, list is, is, is important. It's part of the Proj4 library. And we use the Proj4 library representation, uh, or the Proj4 representation of the coordinate reference systems. This sounds very dry. None of you are surveyors, and there's nobody who's a surveyor here. Okay, but finding out how it works is is quite is quite important. When you have some historical data, other data which is newly acquired, it may be in different representations. That's the coordinate reference systems may be different, and it helps to know how to move one into another, as we'll see in a moment. The basic spatial, spatial uh, uh, data object is a point, two or three dimensions, and so we collect these into spatial points objects. That's a matrix of, 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 of coordinates. And we can associate the rows of a matrix of coordinates with the rows of a data frame to provide a spatial points data frame object. So that what we do in, in schematic terms is to take our spatial object, which contains a bounding box and a coordinate reference system, we add in a matrix of coordinates, we have a spatial points object, and then we associate a data frame with the same number of rows as there are coordinates, and possibly using a key to link the coordinates to the correct row in the data frame. Now, this is the picture which we use f to describe this. This is the, the, the uh, Roman uh, deity Janus, or you may pronounce Janus in different ways in, in English, Janus, uh, who had two faces. 
which is different from the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Slavic uh, image of a deity which has four faces, so that would be more of a problem. But here we, we're showing only two faces. Two faces because the objects provide an easy method of access for people who know about statistics but don't care about spatial data because everything looks like a data frame. And from the other side, people who know about spatial data and maybe don't know too much about statistics, everything looks like a shapefile, it looks like a geotiff, so that it looks familiar and behaves in a familiar way for different groups of scientists who may have different views or understandings of the way in which data is configured. So that what we wanted to do was to reduce the barrier between people doing spatial and people doing statistics so that they could do spatial statistics together. So it would be easier to do spatial statistics together. The spatial lines and spatial polygons objects follow through in more or less the same way as the points. The lines objects are obviously more complicated because you're involved in a sequence of points, the polygon, because the sequence of points making up a line has to be closed, and you can have more than, more than one polygon associated with each row of the data. So if you think in terms of some islands which are part of the same health district, then they're all, they all need to be associated with the same uh, row of, uh, of the data. So that an example uh, from Alinda is, is say, say, say that we, we, we have our spatial polygons data frame, which is called Alinda, and we want to create uh, a new variable, which is the expected uh, number of new cases. So what we could do is to sum the cases over all of the census districts in the city, divide that by the sum of the population in the city, so that we have the rate the incidence rate for the city as a whole, and then multiply that by the uh, by the population in the census district. So that then we get uh, we get an expected number of cases, given that the rate of of incidence is exactly the same over the whole city. It's a rather uh, un unfortunate assumption, but if we assume that that's a fair assumption, so that's the expected value that we're getting. Here you can see that that I'm removing. Uh, not available values because there are some of the census districts are parks so that nobody lives there. So that here we here we um, uh, we would have a sum where the value for the population is missing, and and we can't have that. We need we need the the actual values so that we're removing the the missing values. So that one, if if we then if we then uh, look at this from ten ten variables before we've now got our new variable here. So that here we're treating Alinda as though it was a spatial as though it was a data frame, using exactly the same syntax that we would use in R to create a, a new variable. Um, and the same thing happens if we, say, wanted to run a, a regression model uh, looking, at the, uh, looking at the number of cases, relating it to deprivation, and taking an offset of the log of the population. This is to create a, 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 a Poisson regression. Then, then we can do this, so that the, the treating this object, which is a spatial, uh, spatial polygons data frame, as though it was a regular data frame, it all just works. So that, 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 that takes us to where we needed to go. The kind of spatial data representation that I haven't discussed so far uh, uh, is a grid topology. This is for grids, where the, uh, the information you need for a two-dimensional two grid is simply the uh, the centroid of the uh, southwest uh, raster cell. You need to know how big the raster cells are east, west, and north, south. And you assume that they're the same size over the whole thing. And then how many there are. So that those three pairs of numbers give you a, a complete definition of a 2D raster. So the grid topology uh, class was the first one which was was, was designed. There are two representations for the actual data. The two representations for the data are spatial pixels and spatial grid. A spatial pixels is like a spatial points object, it's just that the points are regularly spaced. But they don't have to be present all over the grid, so they can be present for some parts of the grid. A spatial grid object has the full grid and is totally defined by the grid topology. 
A spatial pixels data frame is ideal in a situation where you have relatively many variables, many columns of data, but where much of the grid is absent. So if you think of a satellite image or a, an extract of a satellite image with a lot of cloud, where the cloud contains no useful information, then you can drop down to a spatial pixels uh, data frame, which only contains data for places or for raster cells where, uh, where data was observed, where no data was observed, then you've dropped them out. So you, you drop out, if you like, rows um, in, in the object. A spatial grid data frame would then, in the same setting, contain not available for all the places where there was no data. So that's the reason why there are two representations. The, the, the argument for this originally came again from Brazil and was concerned with satellite imagery in the Amazon where there's a lot of cloud. So the, it was put forward by somebody who had a, a use case uh, for, for, for doing this. These are, these are the, the, the two classes of objects. Both include a, a grid topology, but the spatial grid uh, uh, then only includes the grid topology. It doesn't need uh, um, a spatial points objects also in, in included uh, within it. And then adding in the, 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 the data frames to get to the spatial pixel, spatial grid data frames. As an example, I've taken an, an extract of a downloaded um, uh, warped uh, shuttle radar topography mission, uh, 2000 observations, it's from the year 2000, uh, with a 90, 90 meter resolution uh, elevation data for, uh, for the same area as Alinda. So once again, we uh, read in using one line. We don't, we don't go straight to image, because if we did, then this is looking at summary, a summary of, uh, of the, the, the uh, elevation data. Uh, some of it is C, because we're on a sea coast, so we want to set what's uh, um, under the value of one meter, that's zero and minus one, and anything lower lower than that, is, is, is not available. So we're setting that to not available, and then we go to, to, to image here. We're also, uh, we're, uh, we're, we also see when we look at the summary of the object that it's in uh, WGS 84. And that's the, the, the picture. For, for, for the area. Probably it's a bit exaggerated for, to have the white snowy mountain tops when it's only 80 meters high, but uh, uh, perhaps I should have moderated the, but otherwise it would just have been green. So that, that, uh. But okay, so the co coordinate reference systems, now got uh, ten, ten, 10 minutes left to, 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 to talk about coordinate reference systems. How, how one would, would one try to work out what the coordinate reference system is for for Alinda, for data from the, probably the boundaries came from mid 80s, what, what maps were being used in Brazil then? Um, and after doing a certain amount again of archeology, span it appeared that probably they would be using the Corrego Alegre uh, datum uh, and that probably this is the one that we need. So what I'm doing here is reading the uh, EPSG database it's distributed with the Argoodle package or in Windows it's and OS X is distributed with it. On other operating systems, it's provided with, with, um, uh, with Proj4. So read it into a database, uh, sorry, into a data frame, and then search in the data frame in the note column for something which looked familiar. But where did I find this? I found this by uh, visiting a website called, and then I'll now... Uh, do this and do uh, this is um, so you search for grids and datums and you come up with Cliff Mounier's selection of contributions to PE and RS. It's a journal, but they're online accessible. You don't have to subscribe to get access to them. Uh, they, they're, they're not organized very well because the ones uh, up to 
2010 are on one web page, then there's 2011 and 12 on a different web page, and more recent ones are on a different web page again. But there you can search by the name of the country and you find his, so usually two, three pages description of all of the standards which have been used that he's managed to document. And in 2009, he had, uh, this is a monthly column, so there are a lot of these, 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 these things. In 2009, he had one for Brazil. And uh, for Brazil, then he describes that it's very likely that Corrego Alegre is there. You, you've checked. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if, if we go with, with this definition here, then, then we, we hope we're going to be more or less where, where we need to be. So that what I'm going to do is all of this turning on and turning off the warnings is to prevent the warnings coming out. Um, it, it didn't like me reassigning a coordinate reference system. When I reassigned it, it gave me um, so a point with, with this. It gave me the 2WGS84 that's making a datum transform to, 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 to move the model of the world which was used in the initial um, um, in the initial uh, ellipsoid. This is the international ellipsoid from 1909. So these are ellipsoids which were developed by people standing on high mountains and, and waving to each other. So it's not quite as accurate as using satellites for doing the trigonometry. As they, it, it's really it's surprisingly good given the fact that people were using mules to, to carry chains around the world and, and sort of measure things. So it's surprisingly good, but it's not as good as, as the satellites. So that we quite often need this to convert the old view of the world to the standard one now. And that then means that we can, uh, we can uh, move Alinda to the WGS84. It's also UTM Zone 25 South. It was that already. All we're doing is, is moving the, 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 um, the placing on the Earth. And so we can now overplot if we overplotted the other one, then this would be a bit out. It would be out by about 200 metres. Because we've now got the coastline lining up fairly well. Uh, said something about reading rasters already. I'll jump over this and I'll jump over that. And that, that, that's what I want to get to. Uh, a tip, if you're a little uncertain about whether you've found out which coordinate reference system uh, is correct for your data and you have sufficient bandwidth to run Google Earth if you don't then it's more difficult if you have sufficient band bandwidth to run Google Earth uh, then one way of checking whether you've got the right recipe is to uh, transform or inverse project your if it's projected data to um, uh, geographical coordinates, but in the WGS84 datum. So this is what we're doing here. We're taking our Alinda, the one that we made into WGS84, but it's in uh, Universe Transverse Mercator Zone 25 South, which is a planar representation, it's not a spherical representation. We go for a spher spherical representation in, in digital degrees. And and write it out here. So here's it's also a spatial polygons uh, data frame, sp spatial polygons data frame, but we can write it out as a as a KML file. This is in in plot KML. The purpose of using Google Earth is different. In this case, all I'm doing is using a simple way of exporting it so that so that we can we can see um, we can see what's going on. Now. Uh, the name of the file was Alinda. It's this one. So now hold your breath. <coughs> and there you can see that probably Corrego Alegre was about right. We don't know exactly because the, the boundaries of the census districts along the coast, they, they, they were very general so that the, li the line of the coast doesn't curve very much. But it looks as though it's, it's a reasonable fit. It seems to have shifted north, right? 
that was, that's one of the concerns that I have, that, that some, some of the things, sometimes the roads change at the right places, others, others they don't. But, but we, don't, we don't know enough about the, uh, the origin of the original data. No, so the, there are there are there are there are possible uncertainties, but uh, at least we can ask the question. As, and if you don't try and put it out on Google Earth, then then you just say, well, we believe, we believe. But with 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 putting it putting it on Google Earth, then you have a way of checking to see whether the recipe that you're using uh, is is appropriate. So that when you're trying to learn about coordinate reference systems, and you say this is this is hard, this is difficult, and I'm not sure whether it's right. At least we know here that that we can probably find the the, the name tag from from Google Earth up there. Um, it says it's a Linda, so it's it's in the right place. It's it's not in the wrong continent. And sometimes uh, sometimes uh, have 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 you ever? Okay, that's probably lunch. Uh, the so it's still half an hour to lunch, but but they it, they have to deliver it first. Um, Uh, that a, a, a professional data provider provides reversed coordinates. You, you, yeah, yeah, so you, you, yeah, you've seen this. Yes, so the, the, they say, well, this is the longitude and that's the latitude and actually the columns are reversed. So I was trying to help a colleague here who was working with house prices in Oslo and we weren't in Oslo. <laughs> we were somewhere a long way away <laughs> until I thought, ah, ah, but they, they were also projected, so it was difficult to work it out from the sizes of the numbers. But if, if, if I assume that they're the other way around, where, where does that put me? And that the, well, since Robert responded straight away. It's, you, you, the people you get data from are better organized. Have you never seen that? Which could be confusing, but it's not—it's not absolutely wrong. And there are even coordinate reference systems that, that prescribe that the first number should be latitude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 if they prescribe it, then we know where we are. Then you know where but if if they just give it give you a spreadsheet and this says longitude and that says latitude and you are you call them and that's long, longitude means longitude, not latitude, right? And they say, of course, yes. And I say, well, actually, I think it does mean latitude in this case. They say, well, why? Well, as, yes, as, as I don't think Oslo's in the Sahara. I would just comment to like, like the, the, our spatial uh, prediction test as an example of that, too. Uh, this morning we saw that it said long the latitude, but clearly they're not. Do you mean they're projected? Uh, yeah, or? Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so, very gentle thing is to have missing minus signs, so you don't have to yes. Yes. The, the, the British English terminology is, is to speak of Eastings and Northings, which is an, east, an Easting is obviously in this direction, so it's longitude or X, and a Northing is a, a latitude or Y, so that, that's more neutral to speak of Eastings and Northings. But again, so that my so rounding up point is that check, show me. So, so that the, the, uh, having the ability fairly easily, one line to take. So I'm, I'm making an assumption by making a, a projection or a, a datum transformation in one way or another to try and integrate the data I have. Is the data actually lining up with some other some other uh, view of the world? In this case, using Google Earth, can one use some of the other um, um, Google Earth like? Uh, engines for doing the same, but but does that give you? Mm -hmm. But 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 can you overlay it on something which looks like ground truth? Okay, yeah. So the, you you would, yeah. Well, well, that was what I was thinking. Is OpenStreetMap is an alternative, and there are other alternatives as well. As Bing Maps is an alternative. Um, any what's what's the NASA one? But it's it's but it's yeah it's 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 it it doesn't give you the same the, the same ability to zoom in. Um, 
as I, I use this technique with, with the Boston data set, this is house prices in Boston, which is a classic for visualization and other things. And it, uh, there's quite a lot of in, intuition involved as well in, in reading uh, Clive, uh, Cliff Mounier's um, uh, work and sort of descriptions of how different mapping systems uh, function. So that imagining that everything is well documented everywhere is unfortunately it's going to lead to tears. Most things are not well documented, and you have to work quite hard to. I mean, that, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. As, especially if as you've worked in, in Peru, and if you worked in the Philippines, and and you you just don't find things documented. You have to use intuition and insight and local knowledge and talk to people to find out how the how the maps are actually what the coordinate reference systems are and how you can integrate them. But if you do that, you can. It's not impossible. It's just you just have to not expect that everything is organized for you because most data which we receive as secondary data has been organized by somebody else for their own purposes and for their own purposes their documentation was sufficient it's only when we need to integrate it with other data that we need more information than they even thought of okay you had a question I think generally it, it's really up to you. And like, like these, these boundaries here, I think for most intents and purposes, they're perfect. Unless you had some very high resolution data for, for that same area where you, you wanted to match it even better. And I think the same goes there. So yeah, so, but, but I would say generally that your data uncertainty for, for these large distributions you know, is up to maybe two kilometers at most. Uh, that's very little given all the other uncertainties. And that, so I, I'm not too worried about this specific case, all general. And Tom, Tom, would that would the same answer apply to uh, to um, the soil data, the global soil data? There's the uncertainty about uh, the position. Yeah. Well, but but that that's in blocks. So it's in. Yeah. So it's. it's Yeah. So of course, the, the points which are more spatially certain and uh, more, should be more important for your modeling, and the points that, that are less certain, you kind of get, mm -hmm. get less weight. But you, 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 you try to address this in filtering the data through. So that, so it, but, but the consciousness that the uncertainty is there and just get to enjoy it is... is uh, so you, you have to be able to, to you have to be able to move away from the assumption that other people have fixed things. Uh, because quite often it turns out that they haven't. It's, a, it's almost a new, a new type of geodata project. Mm -hmm. We have a big project where it's a requirement that we produce uncertainty for every pixel. So it's a data product, basically, and, and you can validate the quality of uncertainty. And some people laugh at it because then they say, okay, we are now evaluating the error of the error, so it's uncertainty of uncertainty or something. And uh, but, but it is a serious thing, I mean, you can, you can estimate something. Like when you do a confidence limit, you can estimate if with the real data if the confidence limits are correct, so it's kind of error of the error, yeah. Well, no, the, the, the wrong data will, will, will put you out by um, at the most, depending on where you are in the world, far north Spitsbergen, you could be out by a couple of kilometers. Further south, you may be out by hundreds of meters. So it's, it's not drastic, but it may, makes a difference if you're trying to overlay small, uh, the maps of smaller areas. That, 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 that it can make a difference. But I have to 
but I, th I think the key thing is the consciousness that, that one needs to report forward so that someone <laughs> reading what you're doing or reading the small print or somewhere in a script you've got a comment, we weren't really sure about the data. So that, that it's recorded somewhere that the uncertainty doesn't get lost. As actually uh, my, my key definition of a, ge I'm a geographer, key de definition of geographers is that geographers like variability. So that geographers like uncertainty. If you don't like uncertainty, you're not a geographer. So, so geographers like uncertainty, they like differences. So for me, it, 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 it's nice finding out that things are different and, and maybe working out how to fix it, but recording it. And that's something I think that it's useful to take through, even though most supervisors won't like it. Most supervisors value certainty above uncertainty. Now, uh, I'm going to do something completely different now because if I tell you about research which is going on in Bergen in lots of institutions, uh, then I give you a very biased picture, so I'll ask somebody else to do it. So Gerard is going to tell you about work which is going on on spatial data in, in Bergen. And I jumped in on this so that uh, uh, <coughs> he didn't get much of a chance to say no. <laughs> so that one goes behind. This one. Uh, okay. okay. And, uh, that's that, and it's running at the moment. And streaming is also running. So that's the. It's in here. So can you introduce yourself uh, properly? Yeah. And this is this is the. Yeah, that's going behind. Uh, no, it's on this side. you in? Uh, no. <laughs> so. hmm. so maybe the, the internet connection, if it, if it does, doesn't work, want to work without no. it. Then. Here we are. Okay. You yeah. okay? Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, my name is uh, Geir Odo Hansen, and I'm a researcher at the uh, Institute of Marine Research here in Bergen. And I would like to thank for the opportunity to, to follow this uh, summer school. That's the first thing. And also thank for the opportunity to represent the institute which I come from. And I will also try to say something about the, um, the work on, on, on spatial data or, or other institutions. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the reason I'm doing this is um, that um, uh, we are always uh, interested in, in cooperating and, and supervising students uh, in, uh, here in Bergen, both at the university and at the IMR. And uh, the main um, subject I will talk about is, is, uh, is marine data, because uh, Bergen is sort of a blue city uh, when it comes to education and research. A lot of uh, the, um, the research uh, going on has to do with marine environment, either uh, the living parts or the physical parts. So. The institute which I come from is doing research and advice to the government. So we're a governmental uh, institute. Um, it started in, uh, in, in 1900 uh, with a small building and you can go out to the aquaria uh, if you're going there and then you can see a bit larger building now, which is the main office. So um, we started with the staff of 20 back then, and now there are uh, about uh, 750 uh, employees uh, at the institute. And we have several, um, we are located in, uh, in, in several places in Norway. So yeah, these are the numbers. We have uh, administrative staff, of course. 
And we have a lot of uh, uh, technical um, technicians doing sampling at sea and also um, um, helping with the, with the analysis, uh, doing a lot of uh, biological uh, testing. So, um, and as you see, we also have students. So if anyone are interested in marine uh, problems, then just take contact and we can see if we can uh, arrange something for you. We supervise master students and PhDs, but it has to be in cooperation with the university because we are not allowed to, to, to um, issue grades. So here are our locations. We are located all over Norway, different um, places. The, as I said, the main office is in Bergen. So you uh, are all used to read maps, so it should be quite self-explanatory. But as you see, it's all along the coast. So we have several research vessels, um, which we go out at the sea to collect data. And I think the most strongest side of the Institute is to collect data, and that's uh, why we are also very interested in, in collaboration, because we use so much time to collect the data that we don't have so much time to analyzing all these data. So, and here is where guys like you come in. And, and, and you have data which is two dimensions and depth yeah. and time. Yeah. So it's 4D data. So, um, well, a lot of our students and collaborators, they get the opportunity to go to sea and sample data together with us. So that's also quite an experience. Myself, I'm going now the 1st of July out in the Norwegian Sea towards Greenland. So it's a good place to do some thinking out at the sea. <laughs> while you sample all the data. <laughs> so uh, we also have uh, research stations uh, dealing with, uh, with aquaculture uh, problems, which uh, for those who are interested in this. And uh, one of the main reasons why the Institute uh, is sort of there is that we are, uh, we are giving uh, scientifically based advice to the government for, for management of, of resources and, and environment in, in the sea. But we also have some research, which I will show later. These are the areas we cover. Uh, the Barents Sea in the north, uh, Norwegian Sea further south here. We have also have acti uh, activity in the North Sea and of course the long Norwegian coast. So it's quite an area, and as you all know, the ice is retrieving in the north, so the area is expanding. And uh, so we are now getting a, building actually a new research vessel, which is ice going. Um, that seems to be a little bit uh, overwhelming since the ice is disappearing, but uh, it will probably Come back, and then we can cover this uh, the polar basin in in uh, uh, at all seasons. So we also have activity in uh, along the um, uh, west coast and east coast of Africa and in the Indian Ocean uh, with another research vessel. And there we also will get a new research vessel, which is called the uh, Fritz of Nansen. Uh, as I said, a lot of monitoring and collection of data. And these are spatial data, as mentioned also. Uh, we, we sample these at different times of the year. We also have a lot of modeling of uh, physical data, uh, which also has uh, time and space uh, resolution. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities here. Um, we also have this international cooperation, and that's why I was allowed to talk here, because there are people from all over the world. 
here. So uh, one of the main um, institutions we are involved in is the ICS, uh, which has its counterpart in the Pacific, which is the PICS. And uh, these are places where, where um, researchers from um, surrounding the ICS um, area, which is Northern Atlantic, they, they gather together and they uh, develop advice to the governments about research, uh, no, research um, um, exploitation and, and, and environment. So this is sort of a main body of, uh, of uh, uh, cooperation. We also have other cooperations mentioning uh, with Russia, which is more than 50 years of scientific cooperation, which is quite successful. Uh, at last, some data, because, um, and this will be very, uh, of course, uh, weighted by, by, by my own experience, but, I've been uh, uh, looking at uh, spatial data for some time, but uh, in 2007, I, uh, we started up a, a climate project and, and gathering data from different, uh, of, of different kinds to, to, to look at climate effects on, in the first place, fish and, uh, in the Barents Sea, but also um, in the Norwegian Sea. Um, after some time. But then I suddenly get caught up uh, being a research group leader and then the science part ended for me <laughs> for four years. So now I'm uh, sort of spit out in the other end and uh, ready to take up the, the research again. So that's why I'm here uh, among other things. So some examples, we have a large um, bottom mapping program which, uh, which are mapping the, 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 the sea bottom at the, um, are in Norwegian um, waters. And this, you can find a website. They have video recordings of different uh, organisms and also they have a lot of uh, GIS functionality and, and, and ways to map um, their findings. So they are quite heavily into the visual visualization of, of uh, spatial data. Uh, myself, I'm a fisheries ecologist, so I'm uh, preoccupied with the ecosystems. And we have some large programs for ecosystem monitoring. We have ecosystem surveys which uh, are going with vessels out in the sea, and then you sample different uh, parts of the ecosystem, like the physics, uh, zooplankton, fish, seabirds, mammals, etc. So some um, results from this. Uh, here you see the, the spatially resolved data. It covers the whole Barents Sea. It's a, it's a quite large area and uh, quite unique data, actually, um, worldwide. So there's a lot of opportunities to do um, integrated analysis here on this data. Uh, Roger was attending a ICS workshop uh, a week or two ago, yeah, where we discussed spatial uh, indicators f um, for um, for um, doing integrated ecosystem assessment. So, um, what we can do is to look at the spatial overlap between predator prey, for instance. That's an example of, of, uh, of how the data are used at IMR. Uh, also, we have uh, data, diet data, from the Barents Sea and from the Norwegian Sea. These are also spatially resolved. It's not shown very well here, but, but we are also doing more um, more uh, specific spatial research on the on the on the diet data, both from the Norwegian Sea and the and the, uh, the Barents Sea. Also, uh, we work on biodiversity, and these are an example. It's not very well visible, maybe, but this is a species atlas from the Barents Sea, which are based on our survey data. 
So this is also an example on uh, how we how we um, um, presented the spatial data uh, at IMR. Uh, so a little bit of my own um, or the stuff I did before I was a, a, a research leader, uh, and this is the we. We figured out that it was the, we, we we were um, cooperating with uh, uh, with people from economy and and other uh, subject fields where we're not which were not used to 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 analyze spatial data. So we figured out that we wanted to make it more available so that they could look at data and and um, and try to come up with hypotheses and, and things like that. So we made a spatial database. Uh, where we could get data from of different types to meet each other to do an integrated research uh, or, or analysis on, on, on such data. So some examples of this, this is um, just uh, easterly displacement of young fish. It's the, the, the plot to, uh, to the right. You see different uh, species which are common in the Barnes Seas, uh, commercial species, and you see that they have had a displacement in, this is the period from uh, 1980 to 2007. And this is, is part of the climate research we, we do on these things. Similar, uh, this is temperature from 87 and uh, <coughs> 92. These, these are pulled directly out from the, from the spatial database. So now people can go to a website and they can look at the data to see, to look at, uh, at, uh, at uh, climate effects. So uh, these are temperature and you, this is not very good color, uh, but you can see that it's, it's heating up in the south uh, west, particularly. And uh, this is the cold distribution from these two years. It's quite a different uh, distribution. And this is the fishery. So the catches, and what surprised us was the the, the hypothesis was that when the cod moved, uh, the, the fishermen would move together with them. But actually, as you can see, they moved the other way. So that's when we that's when we called the social scientists. <laughs> 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 No, no, the, the, the fishery and the survey are sort of different data, so. <laughs> but the fishermen, they earn money, uh, want to earn money, so they do their own thing. <laughs> but uh, they have specialists here at the, at the uh, School of Economics <coughs> looking at this, and we are cooperating with, uh, with these people to, to study this more. So that's also if you're interested in, in these things. They also have marine problems to, to struggle with here. Uh, some more results of this. This is the the zero group uh, again, small fish uh, of cod and haddock, two species, very similar species with uh, respect to to how they live and what they do. Uh, and here you can see that uh, the zero group uh, are fairly stable. They are transported into the system, so they are they are not uh, uh, responding so much. But if you look at um, uh, seven year olds of these, you can see that uh, there are quite a species difference in, in, in distribution. And also if you see in 2010, uh, and 10 for the same year classes of these two species, you can see that the distribution have changed. And these are the things we are interested in describing with the methods we learn here. Uh, how to quantify this in a, in a, in a good way, and how to how to try to find out why why they are where they are, uh, coupling in other kinds of data. There are also other institutions in Bergen, of course, doing marine research. We have uh, University of Bergen, the, B the Blue University, which are are also have biological and and oceanographic uh, environments. And you have Christian Mikkelsen Institute, uh, and also the Bjerknes Center for Climate Research 
which are mainly focusing on, on the physical and also oceanographical uh, things. So if you're interested in, in spending some years in Bergen, uh, you can contact me or maybe Roger and we will, we will can discuss how, how it can be done. Thank so you thank you. It's also ten, 10 years since I gave my first talk at the ZIMR. I think it was about 10 years ago I was asked to give a talk about using R and, and things. And so that we sometimes I get emails from, from you, your colleagues, and say, can we do things? And, and you and your colleagues have taken part in doctoral courses here over the years. Yes. Can I ask a question? Can you go back uh, to, to the last Tom slide? was also given a talk there five years ago. Yeah. 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 Can you go back to the last slide? The last one. This one? This one, yeah. yeah. So, so there's the, for like cod fish, let's say. So you have a winter and autumn spatial pattern. Mm. Right? But is, is the one we see for winter, do you have observation locations at the same more or the same places we have them for autumn. No. This one looks like it's, you, you observe like the whole sea of interest, and here it looks like that you just observe it with some uh, boundary. Yeah, it's... it's what uh, I'm asking is, is it like, so if I look a bit more north, or the north yeah. uh, the northeastern corner, is it really zeros there, or you just don't have any observations? No, it's a, it's a, a coverage problem as well. So that is why why we why we put out the this you know the winter distribution uh, from from different years and the autumn dif uh, from different years, but you can also see in the southwestern part here that the, there seems to be a shift in the. So I, I worked with the biodiversity people and I discovered that they spend very little time on, on thinking about the sampling, uh, yeah. sampling designs, and you know they just yeah. go and they say, oh yeah we observe them. So how can I do some analysis of that? Mm. So here, you know, it's going data. The, the course two weeks ago, we were also discussing the effect of uh, differential uh, uh, Russian sensitivities with regard to the sinking of the Kursk and releasing data. So it's not just the, the sampling patterns. It's that some data may, may be being uh, withheld when there are international collaborations. And this also applies in other parts of the world. Yeah. So that the, the data coverage where you're crossing a marine border can, can vary. Um, uh, you, you saw this with radi radiographic measurements in Europe, that they were calibrated differently between different places. So that when you're matching together data sets coming from different places, you can get things which, which are actually just artifacts of data collection. Mm -hmm. So it's not just how the sampling was organized, but it's also how the different sampling organizations collaborate. Uh, another thing uh, we looked at was the the training of the people taking samples because we we started to to train people in 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 fish taxonomy and the year we started the training you can see that the biodiversity in the areas we are studying they go up <laughs> and that's not you yeah and and it's sort of steadily increasing also afterwards, but it has nothing to do with uh, with climate research, or you can't at least, you can attribute it to <laughs> the to the training of people. So you need to know the data, and also the sampling and the coverage and, uh, and everything. Uh, You'll be here all week, so that yeah. you, you'll be happy to talk to people. Please, please do. Yeah. Uh, we have other people from uh, academic and, and other uh, research institutions here as participants to find them, to so ask, well, what's going on in Bergen and what kind of things uh, are there here? Mm. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, when I was here and gave a seminar five years ago, there was no, there was no support for space time. There was, uh, I tried doing some KML, mm -hmm. but it was really slow and painful. Now it's all solved, so we have the space time and you can do analysis of space time patterns and you can do space time education. And so there are, there's full support for it. Well, 
but it's, 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 so it's, I will I will reveal on Wednesday that this is yeah, not the case. So but if you we <laughs> often this we often disagree. But yeah. it, but it, but it's it's moving forward. It's moving forward. Yeah. yeah. So this this is when we we sat five years ago with Tom and we sort of all scratching our heads. Yeah. What do we do with this stuff? And, yeah. And th there is progress. Yeah. I had to then. I mean, I had to like organize the space time myself. Mm -hmm. But now that I mean, there's a there's a package for that. Now. So it's uh, okay. It's really forward. That's so if, if there are no other immediate points, then it's lunch time. Uh, in Norway, lunch is usually bread with something. That's the way it is. Uh, we're not, as far as I know, we're not doing bread with brown cheese.